everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Are You Kidding Me? I am Naomi Schaefer Riley, and I'm a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And I am Ian Rowe, also a resident fellow at AEI. And today we are pleased to have with us a guest, Eugene Volok. He teaches First Amendment law at UCLA Law School, and he also blogs and he writes sometimes for Reason Magazine. And he had a post up recently that caught our eye. The headline was, couple barred from fostering their one-year-old great-granddaughter because they oppose homosexuality and gender transitioning. So this actually caught a lot of people's eye. Trying to figure out a one-year-old. Yes, of a one-year-old, yes. And so we brought him on to talk a little bit about this case and sort of the general question of how we vet foster parents and the rules around some of these issues. So welcome, Eugene. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So can you tell us just a little bit about the background of this case and also the outcome? Spoiler alert, I think they were eventually allowed to, by a judge, to foster their great-granddaughter. But I wanted to just start with the background of how we got here. Sure. So James and Gail Blaze are a couple who live in Washington. They have a great-granddaughter whose birth parents are unable to care for her properly. So the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare reached out to them and asked maybe they could foster or adopt her. They seemed quite interested. And so they went through the Washington Department of Child, Youth, and Families to get a foster care license. But the department started, the Washington Department started asking them, for example, how would they react if the granddaughter was a lesbian? Would we let her have a girl spend the night at their home as a romantic partner? Or what if at 15 she wanted to undergo hormone therapy to transition to being a boy? The Blazes said, well, you know, we are Seventh-day Adventists. We don't approve of homosexuality or of gender transitioning, essentially. But they would certainly love, they feel called to love everyone. They would certainly love their great-granddaughter. But those are their views. And they are not willing to support the department's hypothetical future plan. So as a result, though, the department said they couldn't foster their own great-granddaughter. They sued under the free exercise clause. And a federal judge said, yes, they win. They're entitled to an exemption from the department's policies. And to be sure, the department could still take such considerations in other kinds of foster care license applications, but it can't just categorically reject people based on their views on the subject, at least when those views are religious. It must base its decision on something more. And I'm reading here from the court opinion, if the only factor weighing against an otherwise qualified applicant has to do with their sincerely held religious beliefs, the department must not discriminate against the foster care applicant based on their creed and must make reasonable accommodations for religion, especially when the potential placements involves a biological family. So that's the outcome of this particular case. But of course, it's just a district court case. Unless there is an appeal here to the Ninth Circuit, there's not really going to be any binding precedent set because of this. I do want our listeners to understand that this is not some sort of weird Washington state law, that a lot of states around the country have adopted similar regulations for foster parents, California being one where foster parents are required to say that they will support a child's sexual orientation as well as their gender identity. And in California, that even includes, you know, hormones and gender altering surgery. And so, you know, this is coming up more and more. It seems to be that there's a kind of fighting of the culture wars almost that we're using foster care to do that a little bit. I wanted to just start by asking you a little bit about how it is that we should see foster care and the government's role in placing these restrictions. There was even a case in Michigan a few years ago where the state decided that even if you held a licensed firearm in your home, you could not be a foster parent. How should we think about these boundaries around foster parenting? So it seems to me that one can think of this kind of case along two dimensions. One dimension has to do with the nature of the foster care. As I understand it, I'm not an expert on foster care. I do First Amendment law, and sometimes it intersects with foster care. But as I understand it as a practical matter, there are two kinds of foster care, although there may be a spectrum maybe. One is basically foster care as a part-time job that you're open to having children placed in your home, the government pays some amount of money, and you have the children there. And you're essentially kind of like a part-time employee of the government in that respect. Maybe not for all aspects of employment law, but you might think about it that way for First Amendment purposes. 
Now, to be sure, my sense is it's the kind of job you only take if you really enjoy it, because it's not a great way to make money if that's what you're after. But that's true of a lot of jobs, right? So that's one side of the spectrum. The other side is what I understand is called kinship care sometimes. So this is when, in this case, it was great-grandparents, but it could be uncles, aunts, it could be cousins, could be potentially siblings that are taking care of somebody who's very closely related to them. And sometimes, in fact, the government asks them, could you do this first rather than having us place with someone who is a total stranger? One thing I think that this spectrum bears on is just how much of, of a right do we think the foster parents should have to kind of keep going with their own religious beliefs and implementing the religious beliefs in the process. So you might say, if you go to work for the government, the government can say, you have to do tasks X, Y, and Z. If they're against your religion, well, maybe you should find a different job. There are some limits on the government doing that, but I think in principle, the government can generally do that. So if it's hires a doctor and says you have to perform blood transfusions, and the doctor says, I'm against blood transfusions, and well, I'm sorry, we need a doctor who can perform blood transfusions. On the other hand, if this is somebody who's really very closely related to you, then it seems, at least our intuition is, and I think should be, that there ought to be some more slack cut to them, some more individualized decision-making about whether really whatever objections they might have are, are going to be a really serious problem. Now, as it happens, as a constitutional matter, there is no right constitutional right to adopt. There is a, no constitutional right to parent one's great-grandchild as such. Parents have constitutional rights. Other relatives generally don't, at least don't quite, although there are some interesting twists on that. But at least I think there's a much stronger interest that people have in raising their kin or sometimes very close family friends or some children or something like that. The other dimension has to do with how speculative the conditions that the government is imposing are, essentially how much it's speculating about the possibility of something happening in the relatively distant future. So here, one thing that's striking is this is a one-year-old. You know, there's a chance that she's going to want to have a girlfriend, uh, romantically rather than a boyfriend at some point. That chance is pretty low, depending on how you define lesbianism as a sexual orientation. It's either two to three percent, or if it's like, if at some point you're potentially interested in the same sex, it's five to 10 percent. In any case, it's a pretty low chance. The chance that she's going to want to transition to, to being a boy is even lower, much lower, as best I can tell from the numbers I've seen, less than 1%. So this is all highly speculative, whereas I think our reaction might have been different if she were 15, if she already said, I'm a lesbian, then it would be more legitimate for the Washington Department to say, you know, we want to place her with a family that's going to fully support her position on this, rather than, even though they love her, be obviously negative towards that position. So you, you might think of along these two axes, these four different boxes. So here we've got one where it's kinship care and extremely speculative considerations about what if something might happen 14, say, years down the pike. On the other hand, you might have a situation where it's just somebody who says, I, I would like to be a foster parent, place some child with me. I would enjoy that and pay me some amount of money. And then there's a child for whom there's some pressing need. It could be it have to do with sexual orientation. It could have to do with vaccination. It could be ha have to do with a surgery that might require blood transfusion and the like. So that would be kind of the strongest case for the government. And then you can think of the other two boxes. One is somebody just says, I want a child placed with me. I'd prefer an infant. And then the government, what role should the government have in coming up with these quite speculative rules as to this non-kinship care situation? And then you could imagine the box where there's kinship care, but the child does have what at least the government views as a pressing psychological or medical need. And the government is asking the great grandparents, are you willing to satisfy that? Not only is it speculative trying to assess what you're going to do 14 years from now, I also find it interesting that the sounds like the federal judge provided the exemption based on religious beliefs. But what if you actually don't think that an eight-year-old is in a position to make a determination around their sexual orientation or their identity, or at 15, that, that it's actually not based on religious grounds, but it's actually based on the fact that there's no defined science here that would force one into a certain decision without really understanding the specific situation of a given child? That's an excellent question, and I think that this is a concern I have myself. I'm not religious. I'm fine with religious people having rights, but I'd like to think that 
non-religious people who have deeply held, say, conscientious beliefs should have similar rights, although the law doesn't always follow that. I've had to acknowledge that. So you can imagine three kinds of situations. Or Now, this is a third axis uh, along which we may be considering it. One is somebody has a religious objection and says, you know, I have a free exercise clause right not to be denied access to this program, whether it's kinship care or even a form of employment, or on grounds that the government is essentially asking me if I would violate my sincerely held religious beliefs. A second possibility might be somebody who says, I'm not religious, but I do have these beliefs, especially as to my great granddaughter, and I would like to raise my great granddaughter. There is some case law. I mentioned there's no real parental rights for great grandparents, but there is some case law suggesting that there's a right to live, say, with your family members, so the government can't use zoning laws to prevent a grandparent from living with a grandchild the way they could to prevent unrelated groups living together. So maybe there should be this right, but again, limited to kinship care situations where the right stems from your family relationship. There's a third possibility, which is somebody saying, you know, I have these beliefs about what's the right thing to do. I have maybe good reason for those beliefs. I would like to implement them myself, even setting aside the kinship care situation. Because you genuinely might feel that it could be harmful to the child, right? Totally. But I don't think that that is something, setting aside the kinship care situation, I don't think that that's something for which there is a particularly strong argument in the context of this foster care as employment. Let's say I'm a doctor and I go to work at a hospital and the hospital says, you know, we're going to be implementing this particular program for taking care of patients. I could say I don't. I think that's a bad program. And in fact, I may have an independent obligation as a professional. If you can't perform blood transfusions, then yeah, then it's it's going to be hard for the hospital to hire you. But I guess I wonder about thinking about foster care as something besides employment, even for non-family members, which is thinking about foster care from the perspective of the government's obligation to the child. So let's say you're the Washington state government, you know, your job, uh, presumably in providing foster care, is to provide a high quality level of care for kids whom you've removed from their home. I mean, you've already sort of put yourself, placed this high burden on yourself not only that we are going to care for this child, but we are going to care for this child better than their own parents could care for them. And so in that case, it seems that, you know, you have this obligation to do the recruitment of foster parents, you know, in this way that will provide the greatest number of high quality options for kids. And foster child welfare agencies already, if you say as a foster parent, I'd prefer to take care of a, of a three-year-old, I prefer to take care of a 17-year-old. I prefer a girl. I prefer a boy. All of those things are taken into account when we are placing foster children because we want them to have the most successful placement possible. So in this case, you know, could you see a situation where the government said, sure, we will have foster, some foster parents, you know, who have this set of beliefs and some foster parents who have this set of beliefs, and we're going to have to look at individual cases to make that decision. And our obligation is to provide as many different kinds and as many different total number of foster parents as possible to make sure we have the right placement for each child that we have taken away. So I do think the government has that kind of obligation. And the Washington government is, was thinking it was trying to discharge that obligation, that its view is that there is a non-trivial, not vast, but non-trivial possibility that, that a child will either conclude that they're entirely gay or lesbian or are bisexual and want to experiment with that. And their view is that it's important for children to be able to do that. I don't know whether that's right or wrong. I'm inclined to say it's right, but I'm not an expert in it, but that's their view. They're trying to implement it as best they can. They also think that there is a much smaller but still non-zero probability that the child may want to transition to the opposite sex and that it's important that the child be able to do that and be supported in doing that. But that's their view. And they're trying to implement it. Now, that's where I think the kinship care versus non-kinship care makes a difference. As I understand it, it's generally speaking much better for children to be raised by either blood relatives or, or people who are closely connected in other ways. I mean, obviously, if, it's not, if they're an adoptive great-grandparent or there's no blood link, I don't think this should make a difference. But people who are members of the family or at least a very close friendship group. So if that's so, then it seems to me for the government to say, based on this highly speculative possibility, we're going to set aside this couple who are the the child's great grandparents and go to total strangers. That seems pretty unlikely based on the speculation. 
On the other hand, if the government says, if this wasn't a kinship care situation, these weren't great grandparents, the government says, look, on balance, we th- we're willing to cut off this maybe 5, 10% of foster parents who would say, absolutely, we're not going along with this program. We think we'll have enough to take care of the children we have. That's their judgment about what's best for the child. And again, I'm not sure they're wrong. But isn't the government taking it one step further, though, which is that If this scenario happens, they're mandating that you must support the child in that view, regardless of the individual context, because it could be, again, that the child is expressing these views, but the government's saying you must take that position as to whatever the child is affirming. But we know that there's lots of evidence that says sometimes it's affirming, but other times kids don't remain with that status, and so it actually could be harmful. So it it feels like it's stretching it one step further than, let's say, for example, supporting your child to, whether it's counseling or any other kinds of supports that leads to a certain outcome, as opposed to predetermining that the child is right from the beginning. It just seems from a foster care perspective, it's making an assumption which could actually be harmful to the child. That's a very fair point. If you look at the question they asked, the questions they asked, here's one of them. If as a teenager, HV wanted to dress like a boy and be called by a boy's name, would we accept her decision and allow her to act in that manner? So you could say, well, imagine that she's 13 and she's doing this. And it's pretty clear that that she's doing it just to kind of spite people or to be outrageous or whatever else. Presumably, you know, knowing 13 year olds, like knowing humans generally, but especially 13 year olds, they could do all sorts of strange things for all sorts of strange reasons. Yeah. So you might say that's too categorical of you on the Washington government's part. And read literally, it would require even somebody who has no objection to transgender therapy generally to say, well, not always. It all depends on whether I think they're just throwing a tantrum. But at the same time, my understanding is even if they asked a more nuanced question, which would be something like if she wanted to dress like a boy and be called by a boy's name, and this was pretty persistent, and a psychiatrist had said that this does seem to be an example of gender dysphoria, and the best medical evidence, according to the medical establishment, seemed to be so, would you go along with that? It sounds you, like their view would be, we still would. Right, so but you just because, added a couple layers. Right, right. So the thing is, one thing about these kinds of questions is they're not there is part of the statute. They're not something that has to be read to the jury in court as an element of a crime and it's fixed. Presumably, if they ask a question and somebody has a more nuanced answer, then they may get back and say, well, what do you mean if it looks like they're serious? And maybe they could have reached some sort of compromise. So I wouldn't quite fault the government too much for asking such a categorical question because they got a categorical answer. Right. And again, something like what you're saying, which is it's often hard to tell. We would need to consult with a psychiatrist, let's say, and maybe we talk to several psychiatrists because we understand there's some disagreement. Then it might be that the department would have said, OK, fine, that's good enough for us. One of the things that's interesting here, of course, is that this is not about adoption. This is about foster care, which is ostensibly a temporary condition that the government has imposed here on these kids. So what about the perspective of the biological parents? I mean, maybe not in this particular case where, you know, there is the relationship presumably with the potential foster parents. But if you are a biological parent and, you know, your child has been removed from your home as a boy and they come back as a girl, do you have any any legal recourse or any recourse with the government for the advantage that seems to have been taken of this temporary state for something very serious and potentially irreversible medical procedures to be done to your child. I don't know what the statutory rules are in various places. My understanding is that parents whose parental rights have not been fully terminated, that would usually happen when somebody is adopted and somebody else becomes a new parent, but whose children are taken away, basically the parental rights are suspended. They maintain some residual interest in, for example, the religious care of their child. In fact, at least there used to be rules that prefer for even for adoption that the child be placed with somebody of the same religion as the parents, in part because that would encourage people to give children up for adoption when necessary. My understanding is they do not have residual interests in kind of in medical care decisions, even important medical care decisions, among other things, because they have been found to be unfit parents. 
and that their judgment is not to be trusted in this kind of situation. I can't vouch for that, but that's my sense of the big picture. You guys may, may know more about this. And I think as a general matter, I don't think we would have that much concern about the biological parents' interest, at least unless for whatever reason we think that the foster care is extraordinarily temporary. So just to give an example, imagine that, that a child has some sort of medical condition which some doctors say you should amputate a limb. That's also serious. It's irreversible. Some doctors may say, well, this is the best standard of care. Other doctors may say, no, we should try to use antibiotics first. That's generally going to be a decision for whoever has parental rights. It could be, by the way, the government, or it could be the foster parents, but I doubt that the biological parents would have a veto over this medical procedure. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that Washington state has some constitutional obligation to treat gender transitioning operations, let's say, as a different kind of procedure for this purpose than, say, an amputation of an allegedly diseased limb. As a practical matter, you might say it's a good idea to do that. I know there's a lot of disagreement, both about gender transitioning generally and about whether it makes sense to do it before the age of majority. Maybe you could say, well, that should be decided once the child is an adult, although a parent, some say that it needs to be decided before the onset of puberty or around the onset of puberty. So there are interesting policy and medical questions here, but I'm not inclined to say that the biological parents, if they've been found to be unfit parents, are going to have that much legitimate claim to control over these kinds of things, at least when there's an extended placement away from the home. So the premise of this very podcast called Are You Kidding Me? is about public systems where officials you know, are seemingly have well intentions, make rules, but the way it actually plays out could harm kids. And here's a situation where the normal rules about choosing a foster parent should be about choosing people who support kids in innumerable situations. And yet it seems like in this case, the government's putting their hand on the scale as it relates to gender orientation or sexual identity and creating this box of what you must do. But it seems like an overreach because, again, it could harm children when there are innumerable situations in which foster care parents have to be sensitive to the specific situation that a child faces. What do you think about that? This very case is an excellent example of what you're talking about, which is that here, the pluses of this family, the real pluses of their being relatives, their being willing to step up and take care of their great-granddaughter, it seems to me those far exceed the possible minuses of what happens if the child turns out that she's a lesbian or that she wants to transition and this couple doesn't adequately support her, it seems to me that on balance, it sounds like they would be a much better place. I'm not sure the analysis is necessarily the same in other situations either. You might say, therefore, what you should do is you should do sort of case-by-case decision-making in every situation. But there are benefits to case-by-case decision-making and there are benefits to relatively clear rules. And sometimes we see kind of the problem with the zero tolerance policies, let's say, and we say, oh, we need to have more discretion. And then we see some system which is discretionary and the government officials exercise the discretion in a bad way. And that's how we get the zero tolerance policies. So I'm not sure what the right rule ought to be in a situation where a foster child is being placed with a foster family that is unrelated, where there's no kinship care. And in particular, let's say they had a pretty sharp rule that says if a child has expressed some interest, romantic interest in the same sex or some interest in transitioning, we will categorically only place that child with a family that supports that. That could be a sensible rule. Likewise, if there's a family, let's say, that belongs to some religious group like the Amish who do not approve of higher education, My understanding is Amish don't really take foster children from outside of their community, but let's imagine some such group. And if there are categorical rules, say we will not place a child with a family that would categorically preclude them from going to higher education or actually even going to high school past age, say, 14, then I think that might be a sensible categorical rule. So I'm not sure I want to have a categorical rule about categorical rules. Sometimes, again, especially in situations where there's one couple who's willing to provide kinship care, and if not them, then you have to go to total strangers, then it doesn't make sense to categorically disqualify them except for something that seems very, very pressing. But in other situations, I could imagine some kinds of concerns that call for categorical rules and some that call for case-by-case determination. 
All right. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much, Eugene Volokh. Thank for you. Us today. You can find this podcast, Are You Kidding Me?, on the AEI podcast channel or wherever you get your podcasts. And we hope you will download and listen to it there. So with that, I am Naomi Schaefer-Riley. And I'm Ian Rowe. Thanks for joining us.